I'm John Evans. Welcome to another episode of One on One. You've seen the video of protesters clashing with law enforcement at demonstrations across the country following the death of George Floyd. Demonstrators demanding an end to police brutality and racial injustice. Dozens of protesters died at those events. Hundreds more got hurt. Thousands of law enforcement officers got hurt at many of those same demonstrations. You may not know that more than 100 news reporters were physically attacked while covering those protests. That's according to the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. Hundreds got hit by tear gas or pepper spray or projectiles being thrown at those protests. Well, for this week's podcast, I invited journalists from here at WECT and two of our sister stations to talk about what they experienced at those protests while just doing their job. Joining us for our roundtable discussion, done virtually today, is Ron Lee, a veteran reporter and videographer with our sister station WBTV in Charlotte. Ron, good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor, sir. Miranda Parnell is a multimedia journalist with WIS-TV, our sister station in Columbia, South Carolina. Miranda, good to hear from you again. Good to hear from you as well. I'm happy to be here and hopefully provide some perspective from our parts. And then from WECT faces that everybody sees covering southeastern North Carolina every day, <laughs> Emily Featherston, our investigative reporter and MMJ. Emily, good to see you. Good to be here, John. Although I saw you two minutes ago as you walked down the hallway, <laughs> but uh, thank you. We're, we're social distancing, right? There you go. And reporting from his palatial estate on the other side of Wilmington, Bryant Reed, multimedia journalist with WECT. How are you today, young man? I'm doing well, John. Such an elegant introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> Not only do all four of you have in common that you work for great television, but you all have covered protests recently, and you all have had some difficulty at those protests. And, and Ron, I'm going to start with you uh, because on the, uh, on the night of June 2nd, you literally took a direct hit of some tear gas while covering the protest in Charlotte. What can you tell me uh, about that night and, and what are your memories of it? Uh, that was just one of multiple hits we took uh, covering uptown protests. Everything kind of started off on Beatty's Ford Road the night that uh, the George Floyd incident went, uh, went down. And um, in the media, you can kind of tell when things change, when things go from uh, lawful demonstrations to um, more riots, more aggressive. Um, they, uh, the protesters kind of gathered on an area called Beatty's Ford Road. Uh, a lot of African-Americans live uh, along Beatty's Ford Road, and they were very passionate, uh, demonstrating, going up and down the street, chanting, absolutely perfectly fine. But again, when the sun uh, started to set, when the shadows got long, that's when the problems kind of took off. There's a police substation right there on Beatty's Ford Road, and um, they started throwing um, rocks, bottles, and that type of thing at the officers. Uh, the officers had, uh, had already stationed themselves there in riot gear. Uh, they came out in the riot gear and uh, tried to protect the station as it was being uh, bombarded by these projectiles of, uh, of multiple types. Um, at that point, uh, they had to use, or in their view, they, they had to use chemical agents to try to disperse the crowd because you really don't want to hurt anybody using batons or anything like that. So they started off with one of their senior officers there, uh, and I know him very well. Um, he had uh, what's basically a pepper ball gun. If you've ever played a paintball with your kid, that's basically what they use, but it's filled with a cayenne pepper sauce. And that's specifically to uh, try to deter uh, the instigators, the people who are the leaders of the uh, of the, the demonstrations at that point, it's uh, it's kind of like a surgical strike. Um, when that doesn't happen, or when when that fails to disperse the crowd, uh, they start using items like these. This is a, an actual flashbang grenade uh, that I collected at the riot. Uh, for folks who can't see it, it's a cylindrical object made of metal, probably about two inches high, about three inches deep. Uh, what this does, if you can imagine, it's like an extremely loud firework. Uh, ground fire, one of the loudest and brightest things, and I'm sure my, my colleagues uh, have seen these uh, during their protests. And these things will go off uh, very close to crowds, uh, which will do a very good job at dispersal. 
Now, the last thing that uh, that police officers and I've been in the business for 33 years, talked to riot police in multiple markets. The last thing they want to do is use gas, uh, which comes in a canister uh, like this. I, again, I also collected this at the riot scene. Um, gas is a uh, is an uncontrollable beast. Um, what I mean by that is that once it's deployed, you have no idea where the gas goes. You have no control over it. So um, in a metropolitan area like Charlotte, uh, if the wind switches directions, gets in between those buildings, the gas could very easily come back on police officers, which many times it did. And it also came back on the media, which uh, uh, we, took, we took several hits. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, and I'm sure my colleagues can tell you, it is a, a, a very good deterrent uh, to get you out of a particular situation. Well, I saw the post that you had, and, and I heard you hacking. I heard somebody washing your eyes out. I mean, I've never experienced that. So is it frightening in that second and a half that it hits? Well, we knew what it was immediately. There, there's no question what it is. Uh, the problem is, is that when it's deployed, um, it affects your eyesight first. It's like this, this burning sensation, sensation, and then uh, the optics around your eye start to burn uncontrollably, and then you inhale the gas, where your lungs immediately want to purge the gas from your system, so you start coughing. But when you cough, you've got to uh, bring in a deeper breath, so that makes it much worse. Um, I was next to a crew, and, and actually that, that video that you saw was, uh, was our live stream. So um, there was a crew next to me from a competing station, and they – uh, they took it very hard. Uh, both the photographer as well as the reporter were on all fours, um, almost vomiting. It was so bad. And actually, had to have a uh, uh, what uh, person that they referred to themselves as a riot medic, who was actually part of the demonstration, come up and administer aid, uh, give them some water, try to wipe this uh, this cayenne pepper sauce uh, out of their eyes. It was a uh, Again, it's a it's a very effective deterrent. Uh, it was interesting. I saw both Emily and Bryant. Uh, shaking their head as you were talking, Ron, because they were both kind of going through the same thing. Bryant, you were in downtown Wilmington when right. it happened. My guess is, I mean, I've known you now a little more than a year. Had you mm. ever been in anything like this? And what was it like when you experienced it? Uh, no, I, I imagine for a lot of us, this was a first time or this was definitely a first time thing for me. Um, it was Different in my experience, I think, because, of course, we didn't take a direct hit. But um, from where we were, it was the wind that kind of blew back the tear gas back towards officers who we were close to. Um, so that's how it got in our eyes. That's how we got affected. Then uh, one of the officers was telling us to disperse the area immediately or we could be arrested. So we were we had to walk back into the tear gas. Um, so we got more of it. But it. It was it was really weird because for us, at least myself, like it, it wasn't that bad at first, but then you know within a minute it was like oh my goodness my eyes are burning <laughs> terribly, uh, I, I'm crying and we had the mask on too which seemed to make it even worse. Emily, had you ever experienced anything like that before? I mean I had never experienced CS gas before I've been trying to describe to people you know what it feels like and the best thing I can come up with is if you ever got sunscreen in your eyes that specific type of chemical burning sensation magnify that by you know 10 25 times and that's sort of what it feels like um but kind of like you were saying it it gets in your lungs and you feel like you need to cough but then you're wearing a mask and so it's just kind of this um compounding effect and like Bryant said we were threatened with arrest and kind of had to walk back into it um we were we luckily we found a water bottle and were able to wash each other's eyes out um to kind of clear some of that out um and after that you know we were able to dodge it a little bit better um but kind of like Charlotte you know downtown Wilmington is pretty close quarters in some areas and so you can't exactly escape it um and i know talking just to some people that came down to bring us water and supplies they could you know it stings your eyes even if you're not in a direct cloud of it um so that was definitely a, a different and, and experience and you, you mentioned were we scared i think at the time it wasn't frightening as much as we we're just trying to make sure that we kept going and we were live streaming as well and so it's you're trying to keep your composure and trying to report what's happening but also you can't breathe. Um, so there's some video of me trying to talk to the Facebook Live while also, you know, sniffing and everything. Now, Miranda, your situation 
was different. You were covering the protest in Colombia on May the 30th, and you actually got hit by something. Can you give us an idea of what happened to you? Yes, yeah, so um, that morning they had scheduled a march from City Hall down to the State House. And so we started over by City Hall and I was uh, intending to meet my photographer um, at the State House so that afterward we could just drive back and get my car and then kind of go back to the station to start editing. So about halfway through the march, um, we met up together, met in the middle, continued on to the State House. Everything was overwhelmingly peaceful um, throughout the morning and they began doing speakers and everything, having speakers at the State House. Uh, after that, at some point, um, a few speakers decided, hey, we should march down to uh, Columbia Police Department headquarters. And uh, when people were saying that, we were thinking, okay, today's been overwhelmingly peaceful, but we're wondering if this may turn, if things may turn once they were saying they were gonna go to police headquarters. But we still wanted to keep going, so we went over um, as they marched over to headquarters. And as soon as things got to the doors of Columbia Police Department headquarters, that's when it kind of started to shift. Really, people were just throwing uh, basically water bottles at the building. And after about five minutes of throwing water bottles at the building, the police descended the stairs in riot gear. And that kind of escalated things further. Then it was almost as if there was a standoff between the police and riot gear and protesters, they were throwing sandwiches, fries, rocks, uh, water bottles. And so you kind of didn't know which side to stand on because if you're standing on the protester side, you didn't know if you were gonna get tear gas. And if you were standing on the side with the police officers, you didn't know if you were gonna get hit by some projectile. So it was kind of difficult to figure out where to stand and still tell the story. And uh, we were starting to get a relief crews to come in so that we could go and edit to at least show for our evening shows, the viewers, what was going on uh, earlier that day. So we were heading towards the car and then some commotion started, things tumbled out to the street. And as we were looking at this new line of uh, police and pro protesters in the street, uh, folks started throwing those smaller rocks again. And then I guess someone picked up a larger rock and that one hit me in the head. And so I immediately kind of rolled out uh, I was standing near uh, my photographer's vehicle at that point because we were planning to leave when this kind of all just culminated right next to where we were headed out. And um, so I rolled over to the side and just called the desk and I was telling them like, hey, I got hit. And they said, you got to find the photographer and get out of there. So that's what we did. He was just right across the street from me. So we kind of got out of there after that. Well, again, Miranda, I saw a post that you did that said you're getting ready to leave, that you had been hit, and then I saw another one that you put from the hospital. Um, having just seen the protest when I was in here in our digital studio, um, was there any fear in your mind? Uh, were you feeling fear at any point in time, seeing that you had just gotten hit? No, I, I never felt fear, which might be... Um uh, a, a little daft on my part, but I just never, it, it never uh, gets in me when I'm out on the scene like that. Even, even after I got hit, the only reason I made the, um, the video saying that we were leaving was because I had viewers throughout the day who were contacting me and saying, Hey, make sure you keep tweeting. Like we're following from home. And so the only reason I made that original video was to say, Hey, the tweets are probably about to stop. Like we're heading out. And, um, after we left the hospital, uh, things had escalated much more. There were some um, police cars that had been set on fire and windows were being smashed around town. It was, it was a very different scene from when I had left off reporting. And so I wanted to make sure that I went back to the station. I was bloodied up still, still wearing my bloody shirt, gauze in my head. And I made sure that I wanted to go back to the station to do another live shot to show that we were there this morning to show that people were peaceful and that this started out with the right intentions. And there were so many hundreds of people that were out there with this clear message, with this good message. And we wanted to make sure that that didn't get lost um, because of uh, a few bad apples that were agitators that day. We wanted to make sure that that didn't get lost. Well, I know you had to have some uh, some rest. And, and now that you're back at work, uh, I, I know all of us and all of your fellow colleagues all throughout the great TV uh, system 
are happy that you're, that you're better. Ron, you have, again, I'm going to call you the most experienced of the group here. You can uh, call me old. That's fine. <laughs> uh, you've covered protests. How are these different than others you may have covered in past years? Uh, impassioned, I think, is the word that I would probably use. Um, we all saw the video of what happened to Mr. Floyd. We were all horrified by it. We're all disgusted by it. And um, the more people have cell phones and the more video that gets out there, um, the more we'll be able to see injustices. And I think for the people that um, this really affected, um, it, it inflamed the situation much more. Uh, it made people – because now I've, I've covered plenty of riots um, from San Diego to – um, I mean, all over the place. Um, this was uh, these were people who were upset about uh, injustice that they believe that has been going on for well over 400 years. And this kind of culminated in everything. So it was very it was a very passionate demonstration. OK, Bryant, you're one of the newer reporters in this group. You haven't covered many, but you've talked to police officers and Emily said that you guys were threatened with being arrested downtown. So what was this like from a fairly new reporter standpoint, as opposed to Ron, who had done it for years? Um, it was very interesting because, you know, since I've started with with uh, WCT, I've been like, you know, I want a situation that, you know, uh, it, that that is different. That's not something that you just set up a regular story. Um, that is a breaking news situation. So this was that situation for me. Um, and it, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. I think kind of like Miranda, I, I don't want to say that I was scared, um, but it was definitely an eye-opening situation for me. Um, I think it definitely helped uh, having Emily there because she may or may not have covered something like this before, but... Um, you know, she she knew the the more political officials. She could talk to uh, Sheriff McMahon, um, Ben David, and just knew them off gate. Had the contacts just in case we did get in a terrible situation. But it was really eye opening for me. You know, um, on social media, there were people saying, "Hey, be careful. Um, you guys need to watch out." And I know we're getting so much through Facebook Live, also. But it was um, it, it was very eye opening and interesting on my part from. Uh, especially from Wilmington, because this is, you know, I, I consider a middle, a middle-sized city, a middle-sized town coming from Charlotte. And even growing up in Charlotte, I hadn't seen anything from this. So this was very new, very interesting for me. And Emily, you saw kind of a, a, a different side of law enforcement, as it were, as somebody who is, let's face it, you've interviewed law enforcement before for different stories. Most of the people in the higher ups you could walk in and talk to, uh, but when you said that you were threatened with arrest, that's a, that's a different animal. Yeah, and I mean, it's not, you know, I think we've seen all around the country um, much worse things happening to journalists right now. So I, I honestly consider myself very lucky that we didn't experience some of the things that we've seen. Um, it was something that, you know, we knew our rights and we'd actually just asked the police chief if we could be standing where we were standing. And so it was kind of, um, frustrating at the time, but we also just decided that, you know, we've got to keep covering the story so we will move because, you know, us getting arrested 15 minutes into this isn't going to really help. Um, and so it was, you know, but I mean, I as soon as I saw the sheriff, I asked him about it and, you know, we've kept pushing them on, do you think that this is acceptable? Do you think that the the way that you treated us and other, there were other members of the media that experienced very similar things. Um, I will say what was definitely interesting and, and definitely eye-opening was a lot of times these days, we're out here doing this job by ourselves. Um, we don't have, you know, photographer and reporter teams anymore. I know at least three of us are MMJs here. And so if, if I, like Brian and I were kind of a team and then we had another set of two I, I mean, I would not have wanted to be out there by myself. Um, I think that I would have been much more uncomfortable. But knowing that, you know, I had Bryant's back, Bryant had my back, um, I felt like we were able to better just cover the situation because at least we had someone out there that we could turn to. I know there's probably a few times in the Facebook Live where you kind of just hear 
Brian and I being like, where should we go? Or I'm like, Brian, stay on the sidewalk. Um, things like that. So it was, it was definitely, I think another just reminder that one man, when one woman banding it, isn't always a good idea. Miranda, how important is it to be out there and chronicling what is happening from a journalism point of view? Um, uh, we've seen now that many of these uh, protests, things have happened, and to Ron's point, uh, getting captured on video now for the first time, they didn't used to get captured in video 25 or 30 years ago. How important do you take your job as a reporter to be out there and chronicling what is going on in these demonstrations? It, it's the most important job right now for us to make sure we're doing our job correctly because what we're doing, we are, we're documenting history right now. This isn't, not that any other day you could just phone it in on a day turn, but right now, especially, it's important that we document what's happening accurately and that we do it to the best of our ability just because people are going to look back at this five, 10, 20 years from now. And a lot of the video that we took, a lot of the tweets that we put up, a lot of the Facebook lives, that could be a part of this larger, this much broader moment. I've never um, participated from a journalistic standpoint in something that is like what we're seeing right now. Um, I covered the Flint water crisis and protests every weekend there, and that was such a movement, but this just seems so much larger than that because it seems like people are calling for justice on more than just one front, and it seems that uh, people are more unified than ever in that, and that's why it's important for us to just get out there and do the job, and I know it's tough <laughs> a lot of days, and um, it, some of it seems scary, but it's just so important. Ron, how difficult is it to be a reporter on the street right now? It's the greatest job in the world. Um, it really is. Uh, as, as my colleagues were saying, it's it's become much more difficult. When I started in the uh, the early 80s, um, mid 80s, uh, we had four people go out in the field. Uh, we'd have a field producer, photographer, a sound tech, and a reporter. Now um, it's been whittled down to, to one person, and you have to do not only the job of um, a television journalist, you've got to do online stuff. You've got to be worried about the Facebook Live. You've got to worry about uh, putting everything uh, online. It's its a completely different type of animal. And when you're dealing with situations like this where you are in a what could be a very scary spot um, by yourself, uh, you really have to have your head on a swivel. You've got to know uh, where your surroundings are, who's behind you at all times. A lot of times, unfortunately, the camera kind of blocks your, your right side. I've had people take swings at me and knock me to the ground because you can't see the punch coming. Um, but it, it, it really is an amazing job. And to Miranda's point, we, we are documenting history and sometimes um, there are scary times in doing so, but it's, it's really what we were born to do. When I say to all of you, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker through June 22nd has documented more than 440 incidents involving the media. 60 people have been arrested. 102 people have been attacked, both by law enforcement and by protesters. 57 tear gassings, 34 pepper spraying, 94 journalists have been hit by rubber bullets or projectiles, and 33 others under TBD. It documents the point that things have changed for journalism, hasn't it, Emily? I think to some degree, you know, so I moved to Wilmington from Birmingham. And so through all this, I've thought about, you know, those images that we have kind of from the civil rights movement of, you know, what happened in Alabama and Mississippi. And I mean, journalists went through, I mean, that wasn't, you know, they were, had, risks at that time too. I think now it's maybe we're seeing a little bit more of what happens to journalists just because, you know, like we were saying about these crimes, like cameras are rolling basically all the time. But I also think that there has been just a shift in the public understanding of how the media works, what, you know, the media is. Um, obviously, there's a lot of political, you know, rhetoric out there that's very anti-journalism and so it's definitely 
a lot more uncomfortable more often than I think it used to be. You know, there's always going to be people that are upset and angry, but I think that people are just much more comfortable expressing that than they maybe would have been in the past. Um, and they just think that, oh, because I have so many choices for what media I consume, I don't have to respect these institutions as much. Um, you know, I think it's, we, there are always people that are really going to be appreciative of what we do. Um, but I think you do kind of, even just on regular days, you have to have your head on a swivel a little bit more than even just when I started a few years ago. Um, so it's definitely an interesting time, particularly to be coming into this industry really still. Um, but it's also, I think, just so important. And I think that we always say it's if, if someone's if both sides are mad at you, you're probably on the right track. And so, um, you know, the more important what you're doing, the more, harder the pushback is going to be. And so I think that that just kind of underscores why we need to be out here telling these stories. That's a that's a, a great point. You know, we all like to think that we're journalists first, uh, but really we're human beings first. Brian, I'm going to ask you this first, and then Miranda, I want you to comment too. You're a human being, you're an African American. What has it been like for you to watch the protests and then be out there to cover the protests? Um, well, for me, like you said, it's, it's... As a human being now, take your journalist hat off. Well, okay, as a human being, um... It's tough. It, it, it really is tough because you go out there and you can understand 100% why everybody is out there, why these people are saying, you know, no justice, no peace, um, no racist police. And you go out there and you understand and you can, you can, you really feel it. And it's on a different level because, you know, you go out there to report it, but then once you go home, it's like you feel it a little bit. It's a little heavy when you go home sometimes. Um, you hear these stories from the protesters who are speaking about what they've gone through. And I mean, all you can do is imagine because you can't live through their eyes, but all you can do is imagine. Um, and, you know, even covering to an extent, uh, just this past weekend, I'll tell you guys, I was getting video of our Confederate monuments. Um, and there was a guy who drove by me and was like, leave that statue alone, boy. And you know, you're like reporting, you're like, wow, like, I can't believe that just happened. But then I, I go home and I'm on the phone with my mom and I'm like, I, you know, I don't know what to tell her. And she's about to cry because she's like, I can't believe that this is actually happening with everything else going on in the world. So it, it, it can, um, it can be tough. Miranda, your thoughts? Uh I have to say that I agree with, with Brian. It um it can be tough and it can be tired. Um, you know, once we clock out from work and we take our journalist hat off, we still are still wearing the skin. So all of the trouble that we were reporting on during the day, that still follows us home. You know, call letters can't protect you if there's someone that just has that hate in their heart. And um, I think that when we're out there and we're covering these protests, like he was saying, there's a lot of understanding there. There have been times where, you know, I hear these uh, these chants and I see everyone there and they're just um, so, so impassioned. And, you know, I start to get choked up a little bit because they're not just marching for themselves. They're not just marching for their brothers. They're marching for my brother, my dad, my cousin, my friend. And, um, and so you have to just uh, take that in, but kind of tuck it away because that's not the job. The job is to report what's happening, not how you feel about what's happening. But um, it, it wears on you. And especially editing um, these videos uh, of these uh, incidents that we've seen over the past several years, um, that's tough too, having to watch it and rewatch it and make sure there are no black frames and make sure there are no jump cuts or anything like that. That is just you watching this trauma over and over again. And you know that that could be yourself or someone you love. When you got into this business though, you got in, uh, obviously pandemic was nowhere near what you were thinking, but I can't imagine 
what you're seeing on those streets was anything like you were thinking when you got into this business either. No, when I got into, I think I started my first job at, in 2014. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't even know what I was thinking when I got into the business, but the, the harsh realities of the world hit you pretty fast when you're a journalist. Things that you didn't realize were even going on, you know, just outside of this spectrum, you start to see so much grief, so much struggle, it, just in all aspects of the things that we cover, that you just weren't privy to as a child, or you just didn't see that in your little bubble. And so journalism takes you out of that comfort zone that you may have been living in. And I had the privilege of, privilege of living in, in that comfort zone. And now, like you said, we're in a pandemic. And then on top of that, we are in just a, an entirely new spectrum. And uh, every, day is, every day is different. Every day is absolutely different. Ron, when you hear these young journalists speaking about these experiences and these thoughts, what do you think? Um, I relish the time that I was as young as they were because I know all the experiences they have yet to go through um, and they're going to enjoy every minute of it. Um, I, one piece of advice I can give you is that, John, as I'm sure you're aware, when you're on the field as a photographer, as a reporter, whatever the case may be, is that you are either loved or you're hated. Uh, there's no in between. Uh, people love the fact that you're there or they can't stand you. Um, so, uh, but, but, um, yeah, they, uh, they have uh, wonderful futures ahead of them and I uh, wish them all the best of luck. Uh, Emily, as, um, as you continue, you move from newspaper over to TV and, and the experiences that you have seen in, uh, Birmingham and, and now in Wilmington, as you hear Brian and Miranda talk, what goes through your mind? I mean, I can never even pretend to understand um, what they go, go through just existing and then having to do this. You know, we talk about a lot how some people are like, if you're overwhelmed or you're upset, just turn the news off. Well, first of all, we can't really turn the news off. So there's that. And then you can't change who you are. And so I can't, you know, even imagine what that's like. Um, all I can, as a professional, I can understand how it can be frustrating when, you know, you're taking on a lot of this, like you said, the trauma and you're you're watching all of these things happen. I think about during our hurricane coverage, you know, we're absorbing it all and it can be really hard to process. And I think it is something that, um, you know, I, I try to be really frank with people about, you know, this is what we experience too. It's not, we're not just, we're not just reporting on the pandemic. I don't want to talk about coronavirus anymore. I really don't, but we're going to until it's over. Um, and so, you know, I think, it is really interesting. I'm I'm glad that these conversations are are happening. I'm I want to be as much of a part of it without you know making it, you know about me as possible. And I I really appreciate my colleagues. I've asked them you know make sure you're checking me, check my tone, check my privilege. Um, and you know I think that that's something that we as an industry have yet to really reckon with. Um, and hopefully this will start some good conversations, not just in all of society, but in, even in the people that are bringing these stories forward. Um, so I'm excited to see that, you know, having lived in Birmingham, I know that things can, you know, that those wounds there are still very fresh and it's something that, you know, you have to keep continuously, you know, strive to be better. Um, and, you know, Wilmington has even, more history of this than I even knew before I moved here. So um, I, you know, I'm just honored to be a part of it and I hope that I can do it, do it justice. Once again, Ron Lee from WBTV in Charlotte. You can uh, catch up with Ron at WBTV Cam Man. Uh, Miranda Parnell from WIS TV at Miranda underscore Parnell. Emily Featherston is at Emily WECT and Bryant Reed is at Bryant Reed WECT6. Thank you all for sharing some of your time with me today and thank you all for the conversation. Thanks for the great work that you're doing each and every day. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you. Now, before we go this week, I'd like to ask you a favor. Please download and subscribe to the One on One with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your favorite shows. And if you would be so kind, please leave us a rating or a review. We really do want to know what you think of our interviews. And the more feedback we get from people like you, the higher we'll be listed on the apps. 
and the better chance we'll have of bringing in even more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of One on One.